my name is Justin. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with all kinds of things. Uh, sexual addiction is what brought me to recovery. Uh, approval addiction is something I've found over time, and uh, depression is also something that I have found that I struggle with. For me, when I experienced depression, it, it you know, at its worst stages, um, it's debilitating. It's it takes who I am and replaces it with somebody that's foreign to me. My struggle with depression has gone all the way back even to my teenage years, high school. I didn't know it at the time though. I I didn't know I was any different than anyone else. I didn't know this wasn't unique to me or was unique to me. Um, I just thought circumstantially things were bad and that's why I felt bad. My depression impacts my family, specifically my wife. Um, I think that's probably the hardest part to it. It's just recognizing that when I get to that point, um, she knows and she desperately wants to help, but she knows and I know that she can't other than prayer, other than just love and support. One of the things she'll tell me is like, make sure you're reaching out to your accountability partners. Make sure you're asking for prayer, knowing that like my tendency and my desire would be to isolate. So when I think about depression, the way I can describe it to people, because it's just really hard to explain, is that for me, there's, there's always a river rushing somewhere nearby and I can hear it, you know, and on my good days, it's like I can barely hear it, it's off in the distance, but you know it's, it's rushing, you know it's there. But when it comes full force, it's like now I'm in it. I'm in the river and there's nothing I can do. Like the current's too strong for me. I can't climb to the shore. I can't swim to the shore. There's rocks that are bumping against me. In those moments, all I can do is have an ongoing conversation with God to just say, You've pulled me out before. Pretty sure you'll do it again. And I trust you. One of the most common ways that I feel that hand reaching in is it's almost always a song. God will be, bring the right song at the right time and it'll something and it will just connect. And it's as if someone grabbed my arm and pulled me out of the river and put me back on the shore. The Highlands song is one of those songs. So the chorus of Highlands, um, it says, I will praise, on, praise you on the mountain, and I will praise you when the mountain is in my way. You're the summit where my feet are, so I will praise you in the valleys. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows, no less faithful when the night leads me astray. Because you're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands, in the heartache, all the same. It talks about God is the summit where my feet are. The summit is not the peak of my emotions or when I'm at my happiest, it's Him. And so that's true whether I'm in the valley, valleys or the actual mountains of my life. And that he doesn't change whether I'm in the shadows or whether I'm in the light. And that he remains um, my source of hope no matter what. Come on, Generations, can we put our hands together and thank Justin for sharing his story. And I, I told uh, the first service today, and I'll tell you, um, I love Justin Sternberg. I'm so grateful um, for him and his vulnerability to share um, struggles that he goes through. And uh, I've learned a lot from him to be willing to share my struggles um, ultimately, he didn't share his story to go, man, I'm so happy that uh, 
I face this stuff, but he sent it or shared it because he realizes that if he can share it, that God can use it to impact the lives of somebody else who's going through that. And so, um, Justin, I'm so thankful for you. Well, my name's Clay. I'm one of the pastors here. So honored that you chose to worship here in this place with us today. If you're joining us online, thank you for tuning in. I want to invite you to hit the share button there uh, on your feed, and uh, that way it can go out and impact the lives of others if it impacts yours. So thank you so much. I pray that you will be blessed just as hopefully we are in this place today. So we're in the second and final week of a mini-series, two-week series called Let's Talk About It. And over the past two and a half years, we have found ourselves as an entire world in this pandemic we call COVID-19. And it impacted so many people worldwide. It interrupted the normality of life as we know it. But while that pandemic was going on, there was another pandemic that was happening that wasn't being talked about a lot, and it's done nothing but continue to, to blossom and get bigger and, and just multiply, and I would call that the mental health pandemic. Scores of countless individuals find themselves facing mental health crises in their lives. And since we don't hear many people talking about these issues, we decided as a church that, and as a speaking team and as a staff, that we were going to do just that. We're going to talk about it. And so that's where the, the title of this series came from, Let's Talk About It. Last week we talked about anxiety, and, and if you weren't able to be here, I would encourage you, go to our website, go to our Facebook page. Check that out, and uh, hopefully it'll be able to help you minister to you or also to minister to somebody that maybe you know who's facing anxiety. Now, I didn't share this last week when I talked about anxiety, but I thought I'd share it today because it's really cool how God works. How many of you were here, happened to be here on Easter Sunday? Anybody? All right. Several of you. Well, we took a survey in that service, and so we asked, what are some topics that you would like to hear about us speak on here at Generations Church? And so we asked for your response, and you gave those. Well, the number one response that was given through that survey is that individuals wanted to hear a message about anxiety. Well, the way that God works is we had already planned this series back in November, and so I just, I'm encouraged by God's faithfulness in our lives and just to be able to be obedient to him and that he already had this set up for us. So that's just something cool that you can celebrate the Lord for. Well, we talked about anxiety last week, but today I want to talk about depression. Depression. And for us to talk about depression, we've got to start out by asking this question. What is Depression. I mean, what is this? Like you hear people say, I'm depressed. What, what does it actually mean to have depression? And here's what it is according to the Mayo Clinic. Depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. Also called major depressive disorder or clinical depression, it affects how you feel, how you think, and how you behave And it can easily lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. You may have trouble doing normal day-to-day activities. And sometimes you may feel as if life isn't worth living. Now get this. There are right at 195 countries on this planet that we call Earth. 195 countries. Out of those countries... The good old United States of America ranks number two in the world for having the highest depression rate. The people you live with, the people you work with, the people who may be sitting in these rows beside you this morning worshiping at Generations Church, the United States of America ranks number two in the world for having the highest rate of individuals that have depression. We are second only to the country of Ukraine. We rank 
Number two, but I thought we were the land of the free. Are we? Sure, there's freedoms that we have, and you can come to America, and you can see the beauty, and you can see all the resources that we have, and you can see all the material things that we have, but it's a reminder that what is on the outside may not be what people are experiencing on the inside. And when people experience depression, they feel hopeless. They feel like they're trapped, and how in the world are they going to escape Psychiatrists use this thing called the DSM-5. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual to determine if someone should be diagnosed with depression. Now, it stands for the DSM-5 because it's the fifth edition, but here's what it also does. It, It means this, if a person has five or more of these symptoms that I'm about to show you for at least two weeks, they are then diagnosed with clinical depression. Now, the reason I'm showing you these symptoms is because if you don't battle with depression, I think it's important for you to understand some of the symptoms that people who do struggle with it, that they experience in their lives. And and, and here it is. Number one, your mood is depressed for most of the day, especially in the morning. Number two, you feel tired or have a lack of energy almost every day. Three, you feel worthless or guilty almost every day. Four, you feel hopeless or pessimistic. Number five, you have a hard time focusing, remembering details, and making decisions. Six, you can't sleep or you sleep too much almost every day. Number seven, you have almost no interest or pleasure in many activities nearly every day. Eight, you think often about death or suicide, not just a fear of death. Number nine, you feel restless or slowed down. And number 10, you've lost or gained weight. Now, a lot of you may be sitting here and go, well, yeah, five of those ring home to me. You know, I look at it and go, hey, I've experienced all 10 of them at some point, but here's the deal. Do you struggle with those, experience those feelings nonstop for at least Two weeks. Because if you do, then you are probably going to be diagnosed if you went to a doctor as someone that has depression. So here's what I want to do today. I want to use the Bible to explain how depression affects us as individuals. And then I want to give you some practical advice of how you can start heading towards a life of freedom from depression. Now, when you read the Bible, depending on what translation you use, whether it's King James or NIV or NLT or the message or whatever it is, you may not see the word depression all the time. But you may see words like this, brokenhearted, troubled, miserable, downcast, And when you read the Bible, you notice that these heroes, these Bible heroes that if you grew up in church, you learn these stories of of these Bible characters, and you may have been like, man, that's so awesome, or this is my favorite character, but you may not have really known that they experienced depression. Several individuals throughout Scripture experienced a struggle with depression. I mean, think about Jonah. Jonah was angry, Jonah wanted to run away, and he became so miserable at one point in his life, and this is what he said, now Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah's not having his best day at this point. It's better for me to just die than to live, so take away my life, Lord. Then you have Job. Here's a a guy who faithfully served God all of his life, but he made a statement like this. I live in terror now. My honor has blown away in the wind, and my prosperity has vanished like a cloud. And now my life seeps away. Depression haunts my days. At night, my bones are filled with pain, which gnaws at me relentlessly. 
And then you have Elijah. A few weeks ago, we talked about Elijah and how he was a major prophet of God, and he saw God do some really amazing things. But yet we find him at one point of his life, and we read this about him, that he went on alone into the wilderness. He traveled all day, and he sat down under a solitary broom tree in the middle of a desert, mind you, and he prayed that he would die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Not only was he a prophet who struggled with depression, but we have a prophet named Jeremiah. Jeremiah is actually known, his nickname is the weeping prophet. And here's what Jeremiah said. Why was I ever even born? My entire life has been filled with trouble, sorrow, and shame. And we could go on and on with characters in the Bible. Moses, Abraham. I mean, we could go on. But today I want us to look at the life of an individual that the Bible says was a man after God's own heart. And we're going to be talking about this guy, David. I'm talking about shepherd boy David that became King David, who conquered Jerusalem, who grabbed his slingshot, baby, and fired that thing up and went and it nailed, that stone nailed Goliath, this massive giant Philistine, and he conquered him. He killed animals with his bare hands. You're like, David is my bro. You know, you're like, that guy's awesome. But he struggled. He struggled. And there were times in his life, yes, he did huge things for the Lord. Yes, he made some terrible decisions in his life. But regardless of when things were good or when they were bad, he still had moments of where he faced depression. In fact, in the center of the Bible, there's a book called Psalms. 40% of the books are, are the, the book of Psalms, they're broken down into individual chapters that are actually called a psalm. And so in that psalm, we don't always hear David going, yeah, God, this is awesome. In fact, 40% of it, we hear him lamenting. Lamenting. That simply means a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. David is writing about his grief, his sorrow. Lamenting is all throughout the Bible. In fact, there's a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations that talks about lamenting, sorrow, grief. And here's what, here's what David said in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Now, let's stop right there. You can go to the Christian bookstore somewhere, and they have this little picture in there of this deer by the brook, and, and it's so sweet, and the water's flowing, and it says, as the deer pants for the water. Listen, that is not the picture that this is. This is, a deer is on his last leg, he needs something to drink, or else he is going to die. He needs nourishment. And David is at the point, and he's like, as that deer pants to find that water, so my soul, it pants for you, God. I'm at my last end. I mean, it's about to be over in my mind. I don't know what's going on. I'm panting for you, God. He says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I just go and meet with him? My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Like, oh, you're some, you're, you're the king of Israel. I mean, it shouldn't things be great? And while he's down in his lowest, people are going, where's your God? And so he has all this going on. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throne. I used to do that. It was great. Why then, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed 
within me. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, these verses reveal some incredible truths about how depression can influence the life of an individual. So if you're taking notes, here we go. Number one, depression has a physical impact. Depression has a physical impact. He said this, my, say this together, tears have been my what? Food day and night. When somebody faces depression, a lot of times they have trouble with their food. Why? Because you have so much going on mentally. There's a chemical imbalance going on in your body. And a lot of times it's hard for you to partake food because you end up getting sick. And David's going, I'm so depressed. I can't eat food. And in fact, my tears have become my food day and night. It affects us physically. The second I would say this. Depression has an emotional impact, an emotional impact. David said, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? You ever been to that place in your life where you're like, why have you forgotten me, God? I mean, I see you doing things in their life and in their life, but what about me? Where are you at, God? Why have you forgotten me? Why do I have to go on and keep mourning and oppressed by the enemy? Where are you? My bones now suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Well, that's what I'm wondering too. Where are you, God? When somebody goes through depression in their life, It is an emotional impact. And you know what I love about David? We can learn a lot from him. He keeps it real with God. He doesn't go like, well, I'm I'm going before the throne of God right now, so I've got to have everything together. He's, God, where are you at? Where are you? Like, do, do you care that I'm in this place? It's emotional. And what we see is David is grieving. By the way, it is healthy and godly to grieve. It's very healthy to grieve. And when we grieve, that grief can can be uh, handled in three different ways. It can be either uh, repressed, meaning I'm just going to think that it never even happened and so I'm going to try to move on. We can suppress it. Meaning I'll just put it inside, not show it, not, not, you know, get healing from it. Or we can express it. And that's what David did. David's like, I'm not repressing, I'm not suppressing. God already knows anyway, I'm about to express it. De- depression has an emotional impact. Number three, depression has a relational impact. Look at what he said. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I say these next two words together, used to, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one. Listen, when we face times of depression, one of the easiest things for us to do is to find ourselves isolated from other people in the world. We don't know what's going on with us. How will they ever know what's going on with us? And so we just isolate and think, we'll figure it out and get through it. And isolation leads us down other roads that, deal, that even bring us to uh, suicidal ideation, potentially. I mean, it, it has relational impact. That's why we love to promote small groups around Generations Church. We need each other. We need each other to do life with. I love my small group. I love that I can keep in touch with them during the week. Or if I have a problem or a situation or I need prayer, I can, I can get on my phone and I can do a group message to my small group and go, hey, I'm struggling, can you pray for me? It's important because 
If we're not careful when we face depression, we slip away from everybody else. And that even includes those that we worship with. But finally, I would say this. Depression has a mental impact. Depression has a mental impact. David said, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Here we see David wrestling in his mind. I know that God's been faithful in the past, and I truly believe that he's going to be faithful in the future. But right now, man, my mind is just disturbed. I don't get this. I don't really know what's going on. And it has hindered me mentally. It it changes the way I think. It changes my passions. It changes everything in my mind. What's going on? And that's why David's going, why so disturbed? What in the world is happening? Depression has a physical or a mental impact. You know, I'm so grateful that last week Sarah shared her amazing story of how God has brought her through times of anxiety. And I'm, I'm so grateful to Justin for sharing his story today about depression and how God has brought healing through songs or things like that in his life. But um, I'd like to share my story with you. My name is Clay Weed. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor to God's people, a preacher of God's word. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But I often struggle with depression. It started for me in the fall of 2004. I was a newlywed, about a year and a half into it, two years. A brand new baby girl born in the spring of 04, so six months old. A youth pastor for the very first time. And there was a family in our church that had two kids, one of them the age of our little girl, and all four of them tragically were killed in a car accident. And the best I can remember, that was the situation in my life that was a catalyst to a snowball effect of depression in my life. Out of the blue, I just began crying all the time. I didn't know why I was crying. I would fall asleep crying. I feel like I didn't even know how to pray or or what to pray. I would go to church on a Sunday or Wednesday and I'd do what I did every week, and I'd share the gospel with teenagers. And things looked great on the outside, but inside, I was numb. And I didn't know what was happening. In fact, I remember a pastor at that time telling me, if you were closer to Jesus, you wouldn't be depressed. So I'm like, God, there's something going on in my life. I'm doing all this for you, but yet I find myself here. What's going on? Why me? At the time, I didn't really know it was depression, but I knew something was wrong. I began coming home to eat lunch with my wife and immediately have to go to the bathroom and be sick. I couldn't keep any food down. 
And when I couldn't keep the food down, it just made me cry even more. I began to, to fear, oh, there's something really wrong with me. Maybe I have stomach cancer. Maybe I have tumors in my body. Maybe my heart is failing. I thought all kind of things. I thought, I'm about to die. I went to the doctor. He said, why are you here to see me? I said, well, I believe I have cancer. I believe I have tumors in my body. I believe I have all kind of sicknesses. And my life here on earth is almost done. And the doctor looked at me and said, sir, you're depressed. I said, excuse me? You're depressed. But I'm only 22 years old. What do you mean I'm depressed? You're depressed. Well, how do you know? Because I've faced it myself. And by the way, I went to school and studied depression. And you fit the bill. Well, what do you, what do you mean? What does that mean for me? Like, I don't know what to do with that. I know how I feel right now and I don't like it and I can't escape it. I can offer you some medicine. Okay, I, okay, that's fine. It'll help you. Okay, okay. Two days later, I felt worse than I was when I showed up. I called the doctor and I said, you diagnosed me wrong. I'm not depressed. This medicine's not helping. In fact, it's making it worse. Well, you called me too soon. It takes 10 to 14 days to get into your system. And I remember those days I would constantly think about dying. I never thought about taking my life, but I thought, man, if this life would just end and I could be with Jesus, how much better would this be? But what kept me going is knowing that I had a wife who loved me, and a daughter who needed her dad. I would lay down at night and cry myself to sleep. And all I would know how to say to Jesus is help. That became my prayer for weeks. Help. Help. A few weeks passed and I remember coming home for lunch sitting there with my wife, and the thought crossed my mind. Wow, I've been up for a few hours now, and I haven't thought about death. That's all I thought about. Oh, man, maybe, maybe I am getting through this. And I soon found out that, yes, there's medicine out there to help people. It's very beneficial I still take it today. But my hope is not in medicine. It's in my God who provided that. I often wondered, God, why? I was seeing people come to Jesus. There were teenagers faithfully giving their life to you. But yet, their leader, now you, the one who's telling them about Jesus, you're going to allow to be depressed. What's going on here? Why me? And for years I wondered, why did I go through depression? Fast forward several years to about 2015, 2016. I received a phone call around 2 a.m. in the morning from a teenager from that church where I served as a youth pastor. And he said, Clay, I knew you were there for me many years ago. So I knew I could call you. I've got some things going on and I don't know what it is. And he began to share his symptoms. And I said, my friend, you're depressed. He said, how do you know? I said, because that was me. And that was me while I was your youth pastor. Really? Have you found freedom from it? I say, yeah, for the most part. Sometimes I still struggle, but I live my life in freedom from being consumed by it. 
So that means that I have hope too? Absolutely. Because anything is possible with God. And I share my story because some of you may can relate. And if my story can help you to tap into God so that you can live victoriously, then it's worth it. That's my story. Now, if I shared with you today the impact that depression makes on a person's life that we've already done, and I shared my story with you, and Justin shared his story with you, but that's all we left you with, then I've wasted my time. Because I want to give you keys that God's word shows us of how we can break free from the stronghold of depression in our life. And so here they are. Number one, pray. But Clay, I don't know what to pray or I don't even know how to pray. Help! That's what I did. That was my prayer. I didn't know what else to pray. I didn't know what was going on with me. I said, God, help. Just help me. I mean, I see in your word you've helped other people, but could you just help me? Help. Pray. Number two, share with others. Share it with others. You say, but that's hard to do. Listen, one of the most freeing things that you can do if you're being held on to by the stronghold of depression is to share it with others. Share it with other people who are godly, who are in the race with you. One of the greatest ministries that we have here at Generations Church is called Celebrate Recovery. It meets here on Friday nights. We say it's for anybody that has a hurt habit or hang up. You know how many of that it is for us? That's all of us. But to come here and go, listen, I don't have it all together and I'm just struggling. And you share it with somebody that will come alongside of you and go, I'm struggling too and you don't have to struggle alone and neither do I. And in Jesus' name, we're going to get through this together. You share it with others. Paul said this, he said, if I must boast, I'd rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. When I'm not doing it in my own power and God's power takes over, then something can happen. You share it with others. Share it with your small group. Maybe you need to go even further and find a godly counselor and share it with them. But share it with somebody. I remember when I finally shared it with people. It was like every time I told somebody I was struggling, there was this weight lifted off of me. Because there was light at the end of the tunnel. Now listen closely to what I'm about to say. Depression in and of itself is not sinful. A medical condition is not sinful. For me to have high blood pressure is not sinful. If I worry about things all the time and I never place my trust in Jesus, is that worry sinful? Yes, my sin can lead to something, a diagnosis, that isn't necessarily sinful. I'm a diabetic. It's not a sin for me to have diabetes. However, with me knowing the symptoms of diabetes and what I need to put in my body, if I go and eat and and I'm a glutton all the time, and it influences my body in ways it shouldn't, then I'm sinning against my body. Cirrhosis of the liver is not um, a sin in and of itself. A lot of people who get that have become drunk on alcohol over their life. The Bible clearly says that is a Sin. So what I'm saying is depression in and of itself 
is not a sin, but some of it is. Some of the ways that it leads up to it. What if you're called in sin and it, you know and it's the Holy Spirit convicting you and you never listen to it and it begins to snowball and you become miserable and it's what leads it into... And here's what I would say. If your depression and only you and God know if it's caused because of sin, let me give you some encouragement. The Bible says, confess your sins to each other. You're sharing with each other. And pray for each other so that, say this with me, you may be healed. There is healing when we share with others, regardless of whether it's sin in your life that led to your depression or whether you just ended up depressed somehow. There is freedom when we begin to share with others. Third, I would say this, if you want to break free from depression, stay aware of God's presence. Stay aware of God's presence. Isaiah says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Do you know there's nowhere that we can go that God's not there? Wherever you are, God is with you as a follower of Jesus Christ. His presence is with you. And I don't know about you, but that helps me when I'm going through a bad time, that I'm not alone, that I have the God of the universe right there with me, and I can tap into him. The Lord is at hand. He is an omnipresent God. And that's why the, the Bible goes on and says, don't be discouraged, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and I'll help you, not just others, but I'm going to help you. And I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Stay aware of God's presence. And finally, I would say this, how to break free from de depression. Put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. David said, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Here David was wrestling against his depression. His depression had spoken over him so much. And finally David was like, oh, no, 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 no. My hope is in God. I will put my hope in God because I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. I told you I take medicine and it helps. But medicine is not my hope. My hope is in an eternal God who loves me passionately. Put your hope in God. Are you depressed? Are you anxious? Pray. Share it with somebody. Be aware that God is with you. And put your hope in a God who never fails. Amen? Let's bow our heads together all over this place. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. Thank you that we don't have to walk through mental health crises on our own. Thank you that you're with us. Father, I pray for each individual in this room. I pray, God, that you would meet them where they're at. And also, Lord, pray that you would reveal to them that they're not alone. And that, God, you give us an escape. And in our weakness, your strength is made perfect. So, Lord, I pray that you would take this message, your word, and I pray that you would do with it as only you see fit. Thank you for your presence. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.